question is, how did you get the amazing access that you did to the Uriwawa people? And, you know, how did you, was it through um, Natinha, is that how you pronounce your name, um, that you were able to make contact? Yeah. Um, well, I'll start by just saying thank you to you guys as well for coming out and, and seeing this film. Um, you know, with good sound, proper sound, this is how we meant for the film to be viewed in community with other people. Um, and so that we can talk about it afterwards, because it is really important to talk about these issues. Um, and, and before I continue as well, I just want to take a moment to pay my respects and, and our respects and, and gratitude to the Shumash and Tongva people on whose land we're holding this screening today. Um, for, for me, this film really began with uh, a cold email to Nadinia, who you mentioned. Uh, I had read about her work and felt really inspired by the work you know, she was doing to defend the, the rainforest and the rights of these indigenous people. And looking at the election and the electoral campaign in Brazil and this really hateful, violent rhetoric coming out of especially Bolsonaro's campaign said, you know, your, your life and your work and your family is going to become way more difficult really quickly if this guy wins. Could I come down and talk to you? And she said, you know, of course, yeah, that sounds great, but you have to talk to Gabriel first. Um, and so together with Gabriel, uh, began working on a film that was really about Nadinia's life as a forest protector. And then that really quickly intersected with the Uruwau as the largest um, indigenous territory in the state of Randonia and, uh, you know, a really critically important ecosystem and a, a really brave and, and dedicated group of people uh, working to defend that part of the state. So, Gabriel, you're you were a journalist in based in Sao Paulo. Um, yeah, I'm actually born and raised in Sao Paulo, but uh, already born in um, sorry, born and raised in Sao Paulo and based in the Amazon. Okay. So, how did you first come to know her, and how did you get involved with with your work in the Amazon? So, yeah, uh, as a journalist, I was traveling a, a lot before and being like a sort of international correspondent. Uh, most of my story, most of the stories that I was covering were conflicts, human rights issues, and, and things like that. And then at a certain point, I was uh, I covered like terrorist attacks and things like that. And I was in 2015. I was about to go to Ukraine. It was the beginning of the conflict there, the Crimea story, everything that was starting to ha to to happen there. But then a friend of mine who's Brazilian, he said. Uh, if you want to cover a conflict, why don't you go to the Amazon? <laughs> There's a war going on there, and you've been traveling all over the world, and you honestly, you don't even know much about your country, which is true uh, for most of the Brazilians, unfortunately. So I, I ended up canceling my tickets to Ukraine and, <laughs> and going down to the Amazon, going south. And once I got there, I was supposed to be there for like 100 days, and I first met Nigeria. And Nijinha's uh, husband and Nijinha's family, and they're all, they're all so amazing people, so loving people. Also, I just met the Uru all in the very first beginning, and I was just impressed by their work, their struggle, their resistance, and how brave they are. So I realized that there was a story that, that was important and should be told, and I just decided to move there. So I've been living in the Amazon since early 2016. Wow, you live there. That's amazing. So with the Uruwa, well, it, uh, you taught them, essentially. They were, it sounds like they were interested, especially younger people were interested in, in technology. But how did that work, and why did you decide to do it that way? It was a brilliant way to do it, but I was wondering what the thought process was. Yeah, so the, the second part of that answer, I guess, you know, in the relationship with the Uruwa was when Nadinia first introduced us to this community, um, it, it felt really obvious that I, as a white American outsider to this community, um, that, that we could not tell this story alone. Um, and so there was, there was that. There was also this onus of responsibility that we felt to work with the community to help explain what documentary film was, because especially the elders in this, this community had never seen a film before. And so how do you, you know, move into a relationship that feels equal and informed um, without that, that knowledge and that experience? And so one of the things we did really early on, learning from this amazing work of participatory film that's a long tradition in the Amazon, Vincent Corelli and Video Nasaldeus, and a lot of really exciting participatory film programs that have already existed, 
uh, we brought cameras and said, you film me, interview me about my life in New York. Ask me why I'm making this film. I'll interview you about your kids. None of this is gonna be part of the film, but let's just, let's open this up a little bit and explain how films are made and explain what is involved in a film. You know, it's a huge time commitment, multi-year project. We're all up in your business for eight hours a day. There's also this huge responsibility that's being placed and, and this trust that's being given to our team to accurately and honestly depict a community that has experienced huge, uh, you know, racial prejudice, you know, all sorts of negative stereotypes pervade in the media by people who look and behave culturally like me. Um, and so that was kind of the groundwork that we tried to lay to be able to ask permission to enter this community and, and start working on this film together. Did you run into any resistance at all? Yeah, yeah, huge resistance, and rightly so. And, and we didn't try to convince anybody otherwise, you know. One of the first things, I had come down for an early trip, we hadn't even really started filming, and there was this linguist there from UC Berkeley. And the Uruwa speak Portuguese, but they also speak Tupi Kawahiba. And especially the elders don't speak much Portuguese. This is an endangered language spoken by something in the low thousands of people left on Earth. And so this linguist had come and said, I'd really like to help write down your language and document it so you can speak it in schools and, and teach it, you know, a very noble venture. And decisions are made by consensus within the Uruwa, so you have to have a representative of each of the different villages there and everybody has to agree before anything moves forward. And so they went through this process. The elders came back and said, we're not really into this. We, we don't want you to write down our language because we know what happens when people like you come in and write this down, you're gonna own it. We're gonna have to pay to speak our language. We're gonna have to license it from you. And for me, that was this really important early realization that like so much had been taken and exploited and stolen from this community by people that looked like me and came from similar cultural backgrounds as me. And the flip side of that was that this idea of ownership was gonna be really important to the community if we were gonna work on this together. And so that helped inform this participatory framework, which obviously with COVID got taken like 10 steps further. Um, you know, meanwhile that we had been making the film, we saw independent of us, Itate using technology in really innovative ways. That was the hallmark of his it leadership. It seemed like he had a real facility and a real interest in it. Yeah, yeah, he was a, a natural, and, and that was why he became the leader. Uh, and so when COVID came and they closed off the community, it became a really natural thing to say, how can we continue production together? And their response was, send us better cameras, send us the same lav mics you guys have, and we've got it from here. I love the scene where Vitete is showing a little boy who's really young. Like, this is how you do it, this is, you know, I, I thought that was amazing. When you talk about ownership, I think that's really interesting because it's, ownership is kind of the key to everything, right? These people just coming in and trying to own their land. Um, and that, so I would think that that would be, you know, that sense that someone could take our language away, they're taking our land away. Yeah, owner, ownership in, you know, uh, sort of Western terms of property and things like that, but also ownership over narrative and ownership over culture and ownership over these other, um, you know, more, more abstract ideas was, was equally as important to the community of film. Gabriel, I wanted to ask you too, so you live in the Amazon, do you live near uh, the Uruawa, or how do you, and how do you work that since you're not a member of their tribe? So uh, the distance in the Amazon, <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, we say I do live near them, but near means six to seven hours driving. Oh. During the dry season, during the rainy season, it's 10 to 12 hours driving, but that's near for us. Uh, yeah, but yeah, since I got there, I started working with them a lot, um, trying to, actually, it was not properly working. We were just like sharing knowledge. I, I was learning a lot from them, and we learned a lot from them during the production of, of this film. And I, I'm, I'm sure that we keep learning from them. Uh, for example, when Tangain got the camera, Tangain, is one of our main cinematographers. He's, he's an indigenous teacher there. And he said, you know, like, I've been teaching these kids to, to write and to, like, I'm, I've, been, I've been teaching them stories and about everything that they know nowadays, but I, I want to tell stories in a different way, you know? And so he was always dreaming about cameras and videos and things like that, but he never had the opportunity to do that. And then we, when, once we got there, and he was like, no, that's it. Like, I want to I wanna produce a film. I want to tell my own story through film. So, uh, for example, there's this scene in the forest 
when they catch the invader, it was Tangan who was shooting it. And there's so much tension, there's so much energy and, and feeling that the way that he shot the scene that, for example, we should we could never do that. So we we are still learning a lot from them. And so yeah, since the beginning, uh, I was I was getting to know them and and sharing like experiences with them. For example, BTT he's been interested in photography since he was like when I first met him, he was 15 years old. He was already interested in photography, and I was. Uh, I was telling them that I wanted to go there not to work, but to have fun and to spend some time with them, you know, like not to be caring, uh, like a no indigenous person carrying my camera around. <laughs> uh, and it's funny because now, nowadays, I, I can finally do that because now we are, we are even like building a, a media hub there. It's part of our impact campaign, and they all have like lots of cameras, drones, computers, GPS, everything else. Bitata is actually. He's he has just started studying uh, journalism, but the, the 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 reason why he's he's studying journalism is because there's not a film school near near his city, so he's studying journalism, and he's also like uh, teaching other indigenous groups to use the drone, so he's he's doing pretty well, and yeah, we're we're learning a lot, a lot from them. He said something that I thought was really great. Where he said something like, you know, we have a weapon now. And I loved his use of that word, and his knowledge that, or his awareness that that is a weapon. And because someone, I think, at another point says, you know, we used to just go to war with people, we don't do that anymore. But I thought it was so interesting the way they approached the invader, because they were polite and courteous to him. They even offered him a mask and hand sanitizer. And, um. yeah. <laughs> yeah, like some, some people ask us about that, like how was the beginning of this process? And, we were not like aliens going there and telling them, hey, you need to, to learn how to use the camera. You need to start shooting everything. You need to take photos and use the drones. No, it, it actually came from them because they were already doing these surveillance missions and catching invaders a lot because their, their territory is pretty, is pretty uh, there are lots of pressures on, under their, <laughs> their shoulders. So they were they were already doing these missions, but they need to to document. They need to 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 present proofs to the to Brazilian pol uh, police and the Brazilian government. So they needed cameras. So we, once we got there, they were like, "No, yeah, we need to learn more." They were already using some smaller cameras, but they they wanted to learn more. So it was not an idea that we just got there and say, "Hey, you need to to study filmmaking or whatever." You know, like they were they were already interested on in that. And, and they use that a lot for protecting their territory, for protecting their culture, their, their history, because they know it's important. And it's, unfortunately, it's important for them to, to produce proofs of these invasions and of what's happening there. The, the one thing I'll add is that there's this really um, toxic rhetoric that, that President Bolsonaro puts forward. Um, he tries to denigrate people as iPhone indigenous, you know, iPhone Indians. Meaning that if you engage with technology, if you are media okay, literate, not that you cannot claim access yeah. to that portion of your identity. And, uh, you know, the, conversely, that the only real indigenous people in his perverse mind are, you know, deep in the forest, not engaging in political life, not causing any trouble. And I, I was really inspired by the way that Bitate and these other young people just flat out reject that false binary and say, no, I am engaged in technology, I'm media literate, I'm very, you know, extremely technologically savvy, and I'm in touch with my traditional culture and, and here to protect my land. And I, I just found that really moving, the way that they did that. Absolutely. Um, the, you sort of create, uh, there's a sense of like the, the American West almost, you know, and I think at one point the music sort of mirrors that and, and that whole sense of like, you know, homesteaders and going out there and claiming the land and manifest destiny, the church gets involved and all that. Were you surprised by that? Uh, yeah, I, I was really taken aback when I first entered into these uh, settler invader communities. And I think it's important to say that the motivation for that came from early conversations about the film and what the purpose of the film was with Bitate and Nadinia and the Uru Wow, who said, look, we've had a lot of journalists come here and they interview all the right people, the activists, the indigenous leaders, and they leave with fairly similar reports for their respective news organizations. 
if you guys are going to do this, go and talk to the people that are committing these acts of violence and engaged in this destruction, because it's not us. We're the recipients of this conflict. And they'll talk to you because you're American. And they have this cultural admiration for the American West and the colonial project here. And honestly, I was a little scared when they first put that to me as, as part of what they wanted in the film, because it, these are you know uh, people that don't have a lot of respect for the rule of law. But as soon as I entered into those communities, I was really struck by the parallels between America and these founding myths of America, that this land was discovered, that it was somehow empty before uh, white people arrived, or that it needed to be charted in these Cartesian coordinates in some way before it became uh, you know, private property, legitimate private property. And especially the, you know, the biblical references, this idea of manifest destiny, the divine right to the land, all of that could be word for word pulled from some pioneering settler who saw themselves as the hero uh, here in America as well. Yeah, that seemed very familiar. Well, you mentioned you know kind of being put off a little bit by those people because that, that, that was one of the thoughts I had. They're, they're very real threats, obviously, that Natinja faces. And of course, we saw what happened to Ari. Um, were there ever any moments where you were afraid? And you like either because of the loggers, the invader, just any scary situations? I'll start, but pass to Gabriel, because it's really a question for him. Um, the, the threats to, to me and anybody else who doesn't live full-time in the Amazon pale in comparison to what these guys and the Uruguay live with day in, day out. Brazil just had the first round of their elections, and the state with the most fervent Bolsonaro support is the state of Condonia, where these guys live. So, yeah, it's Gabriel's answer. I'll show you something. This is my cell phone. I have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven SIM cards. That's not for for fun. Like being a journalist living in the Amazon, like you saw what happened to the British journalist uh, Don Phillips. So yeah, there are lots of risks. I because of, of my previ previous experience, I when other journalists go there, I say that at least for me, I feel that it's even harder than going to another conflict zone. Because if you go to the war, you kind of know the map, you know the scenario, you know where things happen. In the Amazon is kind of spread, and it's like, it's pretty much everywhere, everyone, you know, you don't know. There's so much corruption, there's so much like weird forces acting there. So it's, it's risky. For example, Nigeria, she has received so many death threats. Her whole family, Bitete, his family. Before the film, I had a, I had also received some death threats, and uh, so this is something that you kind of get used to in the Amazon. Unfortunately, and it's insane, and we no one should never get used to that. But it explains a, a lot. And but of course, that during the production of this film, we took uh, several several. Uh, steps to mitigate the risks and to keep everyone protected, not only during the production, but also also nowadays. And we, yeah, uh, the safety of our team and it includes everyone who is around the film, is, it's, it's super important for us. I was curious because Natinja, we saw her daughter, we saw a wonderful relationship between the two of them, and I love that moment where they're wearing masks and they look up at the billboard about Ari. Um, but she seemed like she's a like a one woman force. Does she have anybody working with her, helping her? She's a star. <laughs> she's she's a she's a star. Yeah, like like Alex said, uh, Hondon is a pretty uh, tricky state. For example, now we just had we just had elections. Hondonia was the only state in, in Brazil where Bolsonaro won in every single city, so it explains a lot. Uh, and then, for example, there, there, there are not many activists there. There are not many like human rights activists or environmental activists there. So it's basically her. <laughs> if you try to find something uh, similar in Hondona, you're gonna end up in the, the very same uh, uh, person who is Nigeria. They have the Bureau of Indigenous Affairs, right? Is that is that just a name only? It really doesn't do much of anything. Is it corrupt? So historically, they've been uh, losing their budget a lot. And nowadays, they have no human, neither financial res resources to act. 
and uh, the heads, the main people of the, this bureau, they, they were replaced by military people who were not uh, experienced on these issues. Uh, for example, the former uh, environmental minister that we had, he had never been to the Amazon before. So, <laughs> the, so this, indigenous, this Indigenous Affairs Bureau nowadays, it's kind of ac acting, working against Indigenous peoples, unfortunately. Uh, but of course, there are there there are really good and trustful and reliable uh, people working for them. But there's just a huge lack of resources that it's it's impossible to do something. So you spent three years there, right? And I'm guessing there was a lot of footage that <laughs> you know, well, well, must have filmed. So 